Welcome to the program, Mr. London. Good to be back with you in your audience, Daniel. On the last Wednesday, the 6th of March, Russian missile exploded 500 meters from the convoys of President Zelensky and the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakis Mitsotakis. Do you see this as a Russian attempt to physically eliminate President Zelensky? I think uh, eliminating President Zelensky has always been top among Russia's agenda. In the initial days of the attack in February 2022, that was part of the strategy with setting special forces troops close to Kiev in an attempt to take the city and decapitate the leadership. So this is no surprise and just more testament to the fact that uh, operational security is, is of such critical importance to make sure that the Russians don't have such opportunities to target the president again. President Zelensky said that there were more than uh, 10 Russian attempts to eliminate him. What are the current risks for President Zelensky? I think President Zelensky's risks are always high in the sense that he very much is an active president. He tries to get out a fair bit to raise the morale of the Ukrainian people, to have contact with the troops. He wants to show the folks that he's not hiding or cowering in a bunker. And I think that's a great reflection of his bravery, but there has to be some balance for his operational security because I'm sure every time he goes out and ventures into the outdoors or goes to visit the lines or travels, his security detail must be extremely concerned about how much more difficult it is to protect him from Russian attacks. Is it a big challenge for Ukraine's security services when President Zelensky goes out? I think it naturally is. Uh, that's clearly what they train to do, and, and they've done an excellent job uh, since the war has begun and, and prior to that. But it's always a challenge when the principle that you're protecting uh, needs to get out in the public, uh, either to campaign in elections or, in the case of the ongoing war, to demonstrate to the people resolve and determination and courage. And I think that's been a, an important factor for uh, the Ukrainian will to, to fight and the resistance they've, they've posed. But logistically, of course, it's a complication for making sure that there's no um, obvious evidence to his schedules so that the Russians don't have advanced knowledge of where he's going to be and when he's going to be there. And this is, you know, one part of the Russian strategy has been trying to, you know, hit him on a convoy at the right time with a missile. But they also, early in the war, were trying to operate clandestinely and use groups that might be able to penetrate his security to try to attack him from within. There were dozens of uh, Russian attempts to eliminate Zelensky at the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, but what are the real chances for the Russian side to do so today, because the general situation has changed? Well, that's true, but I think the recent strike that uh, came so close to both President Zelensky and the Greek Prime Minister shows that sometimes, you know, fortune or misfortune can play a factor as well. Uh, the, the president is very active, as we all are aware, and he's out and about quite a bit. You know, when he visits the front line, even if the Russians don't realize he's there, he could come in the midst of an ongoing attack. So I think it's a it's a challenge, but you know, the president clearly is balancing the weight of needing to be out there, which I think has done a great deal for Ukrainians and for the war effort, and also the need to protect himself from a possible attack. According to the New York Times, at least in one case, CIA shared sensitive intelligence with, with Ukraine, which helped to disrupt an assassination plot against President Zelensky. Does this mean that CIA play a significant role in protecting President Zelensky physically? Well, I don't think I'm betraying any secret that the United States intelligence community has a very close relationship with its Ukrainian counterparts, and particularly the CIA. The same recent New York Times article spoke to a long, ongoing program between CIA and Ukrainian intel services, both the civilian SBU and the military intelligence service, the HUR, which has come in the form of training, assistance, and intelligence reporting. The United States has very you know, clearly said we are sharing 
reporting, but has tried to be a little bit discreet in terms of the specifics. So there's one, not to compromise sources and methods, and also not to give the Russians a, a reason to say the United States is part of the aggression in this in this conflict. So the intelligence that the CIA has provided specifically, I believe the director of CIA, William Burns, said in one of his uh, statements that it was the agency that provided reporting that helped Ukrainians thwart the initial attack where Russians spent some special forces to that airport outside of Kiev and the Ukrainians were there waiting and were able to best marshal the defensive based on intelligence. And intelligence will continue to be a key factor in this conflict. So the, the, the closer and more collaboratively the United States and Ukrainian can partner on this, I think the best for both services in both countries. Do you think that the intelligent cooperations between Ukraine and the US should mainly focus and should prioritize the protection of President Zelensky during this time? I can't speak to whether or not CIA is part of that. Uh, the United States has several programs for VIP protection that we share with our partners, done out of the Department of State primarily, as well as Secret Service. So I, I can't speak to whether or not the agency is involved in that. But I, I think the agency's provision of intelligence which might identify operations against the president will be key if that's available to them through their own uh, collection or through that of allies and other foreign partners. Do you expect uh, the Russians to continue, continue to try to physically eliminate President Zelensky and other uh, high rank officials of the Ukrainian government? Well, that's always been clearly part of their agenda. Uh, also, according to press reports, the United States was able to provide Ukraine with lists that the Russians have prepared of Ukrainian officials and VIPs and other notable individuals who they had planned to either assassinate or to arrest right from the outset of the war. So I don't think that the Russians are going to deviate from that. They believe that weakening Ukraine isn't only about the military confrontation, but trying to undermine it from within. And that's been very part of the Russian propaganda program, disinformation program, and also, unfortunately, there's special operations efforts to sabotage and assassinate. And that's just not going to go away. That's a clear component of Russian military strategy. Do you believe that even assassination of the one of the high rank official of the Ukrainian government could uh, dramatically change course of the war, could uh, destroy uh, Ukraine and the idea of uh, the Ukraine as a sovereign state? I believe the Russians seem to think so, but that's a question best answered by Ukrainians themselves. I think it's more opaque to outsiders, uh, particularly myself, to understand what the succession process is within Ukraine. But if there's one thing that's clear, has been the cohesion and unity of the Ukrainian people in resisting Russia. There seems to me no cracks among anyone within the government, the military, or the population that has any reservation about doing everything they can because they understand this is a life and death struggle. If the Russians succeed, that will be the end of Ukraine. And I don't expect the Ukrainians will give an inch or a meter on any of that. So whatever the particulars of who will stand up and succeed, if any of those attempts are brought to fruition, I, my, I have strong doubts that it would seriously impair the Ukrainian effort. Uh, what means could uh, uh, use Russia to fracture this unity among Ukrainians? What tools are uh, on their table? Well, the Russians have already relied heavily on covert influence and disinformation and propaganda. The Russians also sought to make contact with Ukrainians it thought would be sympathetic to its its goals and its purposes. But I, I think the Russian intel was, was quite flawed in much of its estimates and strategy at the beginning days of the war. I think badly misjudged the Ukrainian will to fight, the Ukrainian resistance to Russia, because the Russians had less access since 2014. And over 10 years, I believe they were looking at their own propaganda and buying into it. But that doesn't mean they won't continue to try to find ways to, you know, reinforce the price Ukraine is paying. And it's a heavy price it's paying for its freedom to hope in a way that Ukrainians will simply tire or become exhausted or unwilling to stake themselves in the fight. So, you know, I don't see any end to the Russian effort. I think it's merely a question of, you know, Ukrainian resolve and the obvious nature of Russian propaganda that I 
ideally the Ukrainians and, and other foreign partners exposed for what it is. How do you see the Russia's next steps in uh, terms of intelligence and uh, covert operations in Ukraine and also in Europe? Well, the Russians suffered a number of setbacks in, in both Ukrainian, Ukraine and also across Europe. Across Europe, of course, a great number of their intel officers were expelled, who had been identified. And I believe it was numbers I've seen anywhere from 200 to 400. When that happens, that really impacts operations because then, you know, you have a smaller infrastructure to support your activities and those personnel you have on the ground, it's far easier or local counterintelligence services to, to keep an eye on them. So the Russians have been trying to regroup. They've regrouped in places where they feel they're a bit safer. I've seen uh, evidence of them regrouping in Vienna to some extent, and uh, also in Geneva, which have generally been more benign environments. Those governments in general don't tend to crack down as much on foreign intelligence activities, but the impact has been wide. And in Ukraine, obviously, they've lost a great deal of what they had at the beginning over the years. Uh, I think Ukrainian resolve is much more cohesive in being resistant to any you know, romantic notion of Russian support and protection that Russian intel has used. They even failed, I see, in their own occupied territories of Ukraine, where the people they've relied upon have not been as as you know, forthcoming with them or as useful in understanding what uh, other Ukrainians were thinking. So the the Russian effort will continue. They have manpower, but I think it's more challenging because Ukraine is particularly a very denied operating environment for them right now. It's hostile for them, for them to operate. There's no Russian officials on the ground, so they're operating via principal agents or proxies through people they've recruited, perhaps the few Ukrainians they might have on their payroll, who then in turn have to recruit others and then handle them securely. And similarly in Europe, where their numbers are down, they'll continue. But a lot of the Russian operational activities, as we've seen exposed in the press, are being run, if you would, over the horizon, where Russian operatives are staying in Russia and using middlemen to, to approach, recruit, and handle their agents. And there's a great deal of counterintelligence complications for a service doing that. And the Russians have consistently been caught. Also, Russia has leaked uh, secret talks, negotiations between uh, German generals on Taurus cruise missiles. Bundeswehr, uh, Bundeswehr officers discussed how Taurus missiles can reach a uh, carriage bridge to Crimea. From your perspective, uh, why did Russia do it uh, to prevent Ukraine from receiving this uh, German-made Taurus missiles? I think it was an interesting decision on the part of the Russians. I think what Russia was thinking, if I could read into their minds, was they wanted to take a page out of what the United States has done. So the United States, uh, since before the Russian attack in February 2022, had begun declassifying intelligence, real intelligence that the United States had collected, which exposed what Russia was going to do, which exposed many of its false flag efforts to paint Ukraine as the aggressor, to give themselves an excuse to attack. I think the Russians thought that by doing the same, by exposing this technical collection, and it wasn't really a hard feat because they were attacking a Cisco WebEx conversation, which is not terribly secure and it was easily hacked into, they were trying to likewise influence public opinion, and specifically in Germany, where there are some divisions and concerns, not necessarily over about supporting Ukraine, but how to support Ukraine and how far to go. But for the Russians to choose this particular conversation might not have been the best idea for them because simply the Germans will no longer use this technology. They'll understand, okay, the Russians clearly can collect against this, so they'll stop having meetings, which means the Russians are going to lose a great many collection opportunities they might otherwise have had. And I don't necessarily know that the gains in influence, particularly within Germany, are going to make up for the loss of collection they're going to lose by scaring away the very targets that were using this technology before. Do you expect NATO members to react to this leakage and to strengthen their uh, video calls, uh, their uh, security and their secret negotiations among uh, NATO members? I'm sure it will. I mean, even for the United States, it's a it's a double-edged sword. Every time you 
you declassify intelligence, you go through the process of trying to review it, sterilize it, take out the most sensitive pieces so that you're providing the top lines of the information without revealing your sources and methods for how you collect it. But for Russia to take this move, I, I think it was a bit foolhardy on their part because I'm sure that any number of foreign entities were using this particular technology and they're clearly going to stop and go to something more secure. So I think the impact on Russian collection will be compounded beyond just Germany. And as you suggested, it'll be across NATO and, its, and, the, and the various partners. Does this mean that it could be a win for the uh, Western intelligence community? I think the Western intelligence community gained more through its knowledge and discovery of the counterintelligence vulnerability than it lost in terms of influence. If you look at the press reporting, Daniel, as I'm sure you have, there was very little discussion about the debate over supporting Ukraine or even the question of tourist missiles, at least not any more than there had been before. Most of the focus was on, hey, we've got to be more careful. We've got vulnerabilities. We've had problems with counterintelligence here in Germany, and we just have to redouble our efforts to protect ourselves, which again comes at a price for Russia more than it does for Germany. Let's cover also U.S. politics. The U.S. Congress has not yet approved aid for Ukraine. Can this disruption in aiding Ukraine influence the intelligence cooperation between Ukraine and the United States? The impact I see of this is more on the material issues. If you, you know, just looking at the press this morning, there was an article from CNN speaking to how the Russians have increased their military production capacity to very high levels. So they're outproducing Ukraine and, in fact, the entire West in terms of munitions and artillery rounds. So that's really where the price is. As far as intelligence, one of the, 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 uh, the consequences actually for Russia is the better it does on the battlefield, the more likely it's going to receive more of these uh, operations that are behind Russian lines that are meant to bring the war home. I've certainly seen an uptick in Ukrainian strikes, either by missiles or sabotage operations within Russia against metallurgical factories, infrastructure, refineries, and I think targets which lead me to believe that the, the Ukrainians are hoping to increase the pain that Russians, regular Russians feel as a way to try to weaken Putin's control. So, you know, it's you pick your poison one way or another. I think either way, the United States has to get its own act together and Congress has to approve aid because, you know, the Ukrainian fight is not, as, as we've said to other Americans, charity at all. Ukrainians are fighting on our behalf against a common enemy and we need to do everything we can to support them. Former U.S. President Donald Trump said that he would not support Ukraine if he's re-elected. Can CIA cooperate with uh, Ukraine independently even uh, not in the line with the uh, presidency? I mean, if Donald Trump is re-elected. Well, the president is the commander-in-chief. And if the president of the United States tells the CIA to cease cooperation, the CIA will cease cooperation. But I suspect it's a bit more complicated than that. You know, President Trump is quite the showman, or former President Trump. And I think what he's trying to do is to make statements that he can stand behind, but that don't necessarily tell the whole story. Even under President Trump, the CIA was very active. If you look back at uh, at least what's in the press, uh, the CIA cooperation with Ukraine really started its great momentum in 2014, and it continued unstopped to the president. That includes the four years of President Trump's presidency. So I, I feel it's unfortunate, and I do believe uh, the United States will reduce its cooperation with Ukraine, particularly in terms of providing material support. But I'm a little skeptical that uh, a second Trump term would mean the end to all cooperation, including all ties between the United States military and the United States intelligence community. But again, it remains to be seen. Also, there have been some reports that Donald Trump, uh, as a presidential candidate, could receive an intel briefing on the uh, intelligence matters. Uh, could he be briefed on the situation in Ukraine and could he uh, really change his mind on Ukraine after receiving some uh, new intelligence? Well, it's been the precedent in the United States since at least 1952 where the 
nominees of both parties received intelligence briefings. Now, these briefings um, are classified and they're sensitive, but they don't necessarily include the most sensitive collection details that reveal how the information was collected. That tends to be, I think, even greatly uh, guarded, even in these briefings. But the president and the former president both received briefings, and the former president would be receiving briefings that speak to current events in Ukraine and what the intelligence is saying. Whether or not it uh, changes former President Trump's mind is more questionable. I don't believe that uh, former President Trump had great confidence or faith in the intelligence community when it produced conclusions or estimates and assessments that differed with his own predetermined opinions and conclusions. Um, I think my concern is more, would he use any of this information in a damaging way to undermine United States efforts? But again, uh, it's a precedent. Uh, the, the American people have spoken if uh, Mr. Trump is the nominee and he'll be entitled to those briefings and one could hope he acts responsibly with them. Let's cover also the death of Alexei Navalny in Russia. From your perspective, did Putin order to kill Alexei Navalny? Well, if I had to speculate, I would say yes. Uh, and clearly, Putin is responsible for the man's death simply by shipping him off to this horrendous prison facility. Whether or not there was a specific act to assassinate him, as has been speculated in the press, that there's been some suggestion, I think, by his family and by other sources in the press that uh, the FSB went there. They used an old KGB technique after having weaken the man through exposure to cold weather, to strike him in the chest in a way that would cause him to have a heart attack. Um, yeah, I, 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 would, I would not doubt that. But I think the decision for Russia was, is killing Navalny going to help or hurt Putin? And the, and the choice actually you know, to, to see him killed and neutralized was in the belief that it would help him. But the danger is, does Navalny become even more of a threat to Putin in his death than he was during his life as as a as a martyr, as a figure to, you know, pull people together in opposition. Again, that's something that only time will tell. But the the outpouring of, of concern and affection for Navalny at the funeral, despite the Russian security presence, despite the threats, I think is pretty telling that Putin is not as secure as he might believe he is. But do you expect this uh, protest, this opposition movement to grow up? to scale up? I don't think we've seen evidence that it's manifesting in, in a very public display. I think it's more about what's going on underneath the surface. You know, Russians are registering the impact. They understand what's going on. And I think underneath the surface, it's creating greater tensions that could fracture with the right trigger at the right time. Could it also uh, pre prevent or even uh, make some fractures uh, among the Kremlin elites? You know, the way Putin runs Russia, uh, it's a very small circle. The His inner circle is essentially a handful of former KGB officers, uh, all of whom have ties to St. Petersburg. I don't think there's any danger to Putin within that circle because they're all committed to one another. Right? And They've also been bound to him generationally because Putin has given jobs as high as a minister's position to Petruchev's son, has made the other children the heads of banks and energy consortiums to generationally bound this very small group. Then you go to the next circle and the circle beyond that. That's where I think the fishers are more likely to play. But Putin has done a, a good job of micromanaging, which is bad administratively but good for security because very few people have access to him. Now, you know, at the end of the day, it still could get to the point that one of those few people he trusts turns out to be the one that turns against him. And we've seen that actually in the history of Russia and the history of the Soviet Union before that. So there's, there's nothing that's ever for sure in the world, uh, but Putin has done a, a, a good job, I think, at the expense of efficiency of creating a system where his tightest circle of people are, are less likely to be a threat because without him, they're just as likely to suffer the same fate from the folks around them and, and the circles that permeate thereafter. Recently, you tweeted that in order to change Putin's calculus, it's important to uh, take actions that could 
uh, create some insecurities which could be uh, which could exploit his own paranoia. What do you mean by tweeting that and how could it look like? You know, when, when I'm asked to speak to why Putin made the decision to invade Ukraine, and uh, it's in the context of people saying, well, you know, Putin has this tremendous ego, he's reckless, he's crazy, he's thinking about his legacy. My response is that his decision was based out of fear. Putin ultimately fears a threat to himself and to his regime. And, and he believes that the West particularly is, is his enemy and is, is not giving up on its efforts to unseat him. And Putin taking a look at Ukraine and its development and its democratic movement and it's, it's, it's getting closer to the West, he believed was a time-sensitive threat which forced him to act. Similarly, I believe it's Putin's fears about what might caused him to lose power, which I think for Putin is namely his military, which he doesn't trust, uh, an insider, uh, or perhaps this organic outgrowing of resistance because people start losing hope and losing fear that I think are Putin's greatest vulnerabilities. So he does not respond to words. He responds to actions, and he does. I don't believe that Putin is reckless. I think if Putin sees a real threat, he's not going to, as we say in the West, fall on his sword over pride but will respond. And so my suggestion and encouragement is that the United States, instead of doing something proportional or turning the other cheek, tie into these fears that Putin has, make outreaches to the opposition, give him the fear uh, through information, disinformation, manipulation, what have you, that folks on his own, within his own circle are moving against him, that there's a movement organically across the Russian population, or that the military itself is trying to undermine him, I think are, are good tools to use that might force Putin to think more about protecting himself and becoming less aggressive externally. Thank you, Mr. London, for your time and for your support for Ukraine and uh, glory to Ukraine. Thanks, Daniel. It's always a pleasure and the best of luck to you all. Thank you.